Hello, everybody. Can you uh, see us and hear us? This seems to be working, doesn't it? There's a blue light. Yes, there's a picture there. Yeah. Okay, great. So you can hear us now. Okay, brilliant. Okay. <laughs> okay, everybody, we have Mervyn with us again today, and uh, this will answer all the questions that we were asking last time. So I'll uh, turn it over to him. Stop. Yeah, thanks very much, Noah. Uh, Hello, everybody. Uh, continuing on from module one last week, uh, we have module two today. A similar format. Um, please, uh, as we go through, if you have any questions at all, please ask them at the time, and we will take breaks during the presentation uh, and, and have a catch up and answer your questions as we go, rather than leaving it to the end. Don't leave it to the end, um, because if there's something you don't understand, we need to correct it straight away before we move on. Um, so last week, we were looking at, in terms of the uh, UK BIM strategy, all of the documentation uh, that makes up the deliverable, which is known as BIM Level 2. Uh, this week, I just want to uh, go into a bit more detail onto uh, the BS 1192 and particularly the common data environment. So if we start there, so this is the common data environment and I will towards the end uh, have a very quick discussion on the DPOW and what is the relationship between the BS1192 and the DPOW. Uh, just to remind ourselves, we're talking about BIM Level 2. We're not talking about CAD systems, BIM systems. This is not about software. This is about process. Uh, it's about procedure and it's about the management and delivery of data throughout the project lifecycle. And it is up to what is known as BIM Level 2. BIM Level 2 is this line here. Uh, we're not moving any further past that. Most people are struggling, well, not struggling, but a challenge at the moment to deliver up to BIM Level 2. Um, so if you get people telling you that they're in BIM Level 3, um, I wouldn't take too much notice uh, because BIM Level 3 has not been defined. And therefore, it's impossible to say whether you're in BIM Level 3 or not. What we're looking at is delivery up to BIM level two. And I think, yep, yeah, sorry. <laughs> we have to go back. Right. Um, what I'd like to start with is what is the problem that the common data environment and BS 1192 is actually trying to solve? Because there is a problem, and there are problems out there uh, that are accounting for an increase in cost um, through research. We, we know this of 20 to 25% uh, on at least 50% of all the projects delivered. So what is the problem? This uh, diagram or this slide is showing two drawings from two disciplines, the architect and the structural engineer. Uh, both have been checked, reviewed, and signed off fit for construction or suitable for construction and have been delivered to site. So these two drawings have been taken from the site issue receiving on site. And in, in, in uh, traditional terms, what we used to do at this stage is to overlay the two drawings and then pin them on the uh, site hut window, wait for the sun to shine, and we could see what the difference was uh, between the two drawings. Unfortunately, we are still doing that in the digital age. So that's what I'm attempting to do here is just to show that say, the problem that occurred then when we were producing this information uh, analog on paper is exactly the same as the problem we seem to have now in the digital world. So this is overlaying the architects and the structural, as, structural engineers information. And as you can see, there is a mismatch in that information. We're using systems that have 
full coordinated uh, structures, databases behind them. So everything should be to the same scale. Everything should be in the same location. And unfortunately, they're not. And even looking at this, this combination of drawings, you have to ask who owns what. Uh, that's not going to be a subject uh, of this, uh, this afternoon's module. That will be in, in the next module, uh, looking at ownership of, of information. But what we are showing here is why would the structural engineer draw or redraw the doors as shown on the architect's drawing? It's of no interest to the structural engineer where the door is. Um, it's only supposed to be indicating where the structure is in context with the architectural fabric. So why are we redrawing? So we have a problem here of over-processing uh, and or, or over-producing uh, information. We can cut that out straight away. But what we are interested in is why do they mismatch? And part of the reason is that uh, the argument is given that we do not trust other people's information. So we redraw it rather than re use it. So when it gets to site, we overlay the drawings one on top of the other, and what we have is inaccurate information, uncoordinated information, and ambiguous information. So which one of these do we do we build from? And that starts the problem of trying to solve problems on the site, so trying to construct something that you don't have the correct information for, in a digital world where we should be able to produce this information and solve all these problems before they get to site. I have to point out that these two drawings were produced on CAD systems and they are of a live project, or what was a live project. So this is our problem. How do we get rid of this? Well, we're told by the vendors uh, of, of, of software that of course, if you buy a 3D system, then magically all of these problems will disappear. So here we have, uh, we've combined a number of disciplines models. And as you can see, the problem hasn't disappeared. We're still generating clashes. So pipes are going through the beams, pipes are clashing with pipes. Well, here we've got uh, service pipes uh, clashing with down, down, down pipes, water pipes. And I could go further into this model. There are clashes everywhere because people are not coordinating their information. Um, as they go, they're putting all this stuff together and then looking at a solution uh, for somebody to go through the models and come up with a clash detection list. This is not lean. This is not the right way to work. BS 1192 has been designed and developed to get rid of all these problems and to deliver a clash free set of information. So what happens to all these clashes if they arrive on site? Well, somebody has to come up with a solution. And sometimes those solutions can be extremely dangerous. This is uh, off a project. Um, and what's happened here is you have a pipe clashing with part of the structural member. The solution given by the design teams or the management teams on site is, well, we can't cut the pipe carrying the water. So we'll have to cut the pipe, um, which is part of the structural frame. So we just cut a hole in it. We don't go and ask the engineer, if we can do this um, and the way that the joint has been cleaned up here with an angle grinder it looks to me as if they may actually be going to weld the two pipes together which may uh, produce some sort of structural integrity but then what happens if the pipe needs to be changed at some time it has a leak or it's rusted or whatever what happens then uh, you have to start grinding this away this is not a good solution. It should never have occurred on site. It can all be sorted out and got rid of during the design process. So what is the relationship between PAS 1192 and BS 1192-2007, the common data environment? Um, I just wanted to show this very quickly because we spoke about the PAS last week and we talk about BS 1192. Uh, and what is the relationship between those two documents? So very quickly before we move on, the green portion of the diagram uh, in the middle of the screen here, this portion in green and the green elements running along the bottom, which are the information exchange points, uh, is BS 1192. It's all about the production of information through the stages. 
um, on, in this case, these are the DPOW, the Digital Plans of Work, uh, not allied to any particular institute at this stage. So the numbers are there. We have given some names just for the sake of, uh, of pro pro promoting this and presenting it um, as to what happens at each of those stages. But in a digital plan of work, they could be different, different countries, di different uh, disciplines would have different deliveries. The blue line running around the outside is the management process uh, for delivering the information produced in the common data environment. So common data environment green is about developing information the blue line is about requesting it and then managing it into delivery. So the blue line is PAS 1192 and the green is the BS 1192-2007. PAS is trying to bring the development of information and the management of information together into one document. It's not actually uh, worked uh, fully. So you do require both documents, BS 1192-207 and PAS 1192-PAR2 to deliver the BIM Level 2 strategy. The fundamental requirement for producing information through a collaborative activity is to share that information. And, and that is what the common data environment is, is about. It is about setting up uh, communication systems, either in a co-located environment or in a distributed in, uh, environment where we can actually share signed off qualified information quickly and easily uh, so that everybody has access to good quality signed off information checked and signed off and the major point here is about the check what we also need to do um, to give people uh, confidence that any information they share is not going to be changed in some way or used for some purpose that it's not supposed to be used for we must have a system that maintains an audit trail of who did what, where and when, who supplied information, who used that information. It's also a requirement of most of the professional indemnity insurances that they need to know who has the responsibility to, for delivering what and how it was delivered. In the event of something going wrong, the insurers can go to the common data environment and they can see exactly what happened, it has a full audit trail of how the project was run, what decisions were made, and who delivered what information at what time. So the requirements of the common data environment process is that qualified information is used by all in the shared area. The CD allows the originators of information the ability to define what that information can be used for and then shared. One of the uh, points that came up in when we were developing this was well How do I stop people using information that I don't want them to use it for that? It's not suitable For well the common data environment allows you to specify at the point of sharing what that information can be used for it cannot be used for any other purpose The common data uh, is a means of allowing information to be shared efficiently and accurately between members of the project team whether that information is in 2D or 3D. The point about the common data environment, it is not just about 3D. It is about 2D information. It is about all other documents, um, schedules, uh, um, any, any project information uh, that is needed to deliver the, the given project. That is all managed by the common data environment, not just the model. The CDE enables multidisciplinary design teams to collaborate in a managed environment where the build-up and development of information follows the design, manufacturing, and construction sequence. So we're not changing anything. Um, that is, you still carry on working in the way you should have been working and may not have been. And certainly evidence shows that over the last 20 years, um, collaborative practices have actually um, are not being used any, any longer. And all we're trying to do is to put back those processes and methodology we knew that worked but with the technology, we can now manage that process and audit it um, as, we, as we go along. Uh, other things with the common data environment is to ensure that information is only generated once and then reused as many times as possible without change. So you do not, if we go back to that original drawing, the overlay of information, there is no need to redraw one another's information as long as it has been checked, reviewed, and signed off as suitable for spatial coordination, then you may use that information as a background 
onto which you then develop your information. In a 3D world, this is, as we'll see later on uh, in, in this presentation, allows you to develop your 3D information in context with others in such a way that you do not get a clash. You actually design and model out the clash. There are no clashes in the model. So we have a clash-free delivery of information. We do not have to do clash detection at the end of the day. The archive, sorry, this information at the end of the day is then collected uh, together and is passed through into the asset information model for the FM to produce the FM document. So we are generating information, managing the information right the way through the delivery cycle for delivery in, into FM. Uh, one of the more important items here, as I've already mentioned, is the archive, which is where we keep an audit trail of all transactions. So as it says there, uh, in the event of a legal dispute or some project failure, uh, then the health and safety executive and others can access that information to find out why things went wrong. What does the common data environment look like? It's basically shown in this simplistic view um, of the common data environment, these, these four boxes. Work in progress, this is where you work in your own office, delivering information or generating information. Sorry. Sorry. I, I, <laughs> um, so in the blue area is actually the work in progress area. And there are any number of different disciplines working in their own offices on their own information. Before you share it with others in another discipline, in another office, then you have to go through this approval process, this check, review and sign off process, and then put it into the shared area so that others can reference your information as a background to developing their own. And at some point uh, in the delivery of information, you will uh, reach a milestone where you need to deliver uh, a contracted uh, delivery of information. Then you can combine the information out of the shared area into, let's say, drawings. And you can then go through an authorization process where they become accepted as contractual documents. So out of detail design, um, issuing those drawings as design complete, design intent complete, and then publish to the contractor for further work. The archive, as we've said, then uh, you verify the information going into the archive, uh, and this holds a full record of all of the transactions, a full audit trail of who said what, who delivered what, and when they delivered it throughout the whole project life cycle. And that is the common data environment. So if we go back and look at this in detail, are there any questions that we need to answer before we move on? Uh, there was a request. Uh, would it, is it possible to uh, reference uh, the page number for the uh, uh, for the things that are coming out of the PAS? <clears throat> is that possible? Um, no. Uh, the reason is that these diagrams are actually taken from a document called the Guide to BS 1192-2007. Um, so you will not find uh reference pages with these diagrams on them in the past you would have to look at the uh, guide to bs 1192 it's a document called bip 2207 um it actually there is a cost to it you can buy it off amazon or i understand by the new year it would actually be free for download by the bim task group but for the moment i think it costs about 28 pounds on amazon uh, question, uh, shouldn't in-house teams only reference each other's shared information? Otherwise, in-house, you would be working to different info to that of the wider team. Uh, sorry, I'm just <laughs> trying to gather in my mind what you're asking for. If you're in an architect's office, let us say, and you're only referencing one another's information in the architect's office, how can you be producing information in context with the structural engineer? So the way to answer this question is, even when you are referencing one another's work in your own office, the information that you're referencing between one another should have been checked and signed off before you use it in your own office. Otherwise, you will and can, and we know, produce abortive work even in your own office. So sharing of information in the office should actually go out to check review and, pro and uh, sign off process into the shared area so that it can be referenced back within your own office. 
and also you have access to other disciplines information in the shared area so that you can reference that into your files to use as a backdrop when you are generating your own information remember that this is looking at a file-based process with a federated model so we are not talking about the single model this is about small models being developed by different people in different offices and collaborating to come up with one single source of information that represents the whole project so referencing between one another should be checked in the same way as referencing uh, across disciplines should also be checked before you reuse it Thank you, Marvin. Another question, is it not better to ensure uh, all work in progress areas are stored on a common data environment, uh, on a common CDE issue, not designers working on remote servers? Um, we'll have a look at a slide later on today at the distributed network. So we do have people working within their own offices using the same processes uh, and practices that uh, are uh, generated have been written up in the BS 1192-207. So if you work in this way in your office, when you come together on a project, lots of different offices come together on a project, you will know how one another work and there will be no need to relearn uh, these practices just for a project. However, if you are working in a distributed environment, you do have internet links or in, uh, intranet links or even extranet links between the different offices and the whole uh, network is then managed uh, in the, as a single common data environment. So part of the answer to your question is yes, and yes, you can produce a virtual distributed network that, that operates and acts as a single unit. Um, an interesting question here. Is there a standard template as to what should be checked in phase one approval? I'm guessing it means a work in progress phase. Okay, um, as part of the requirement of any project, uh, the first task uh, that all the teams have to carry out um, once the contract has been awarded is to agree with the project information manager the standards, methods and procedures that will be used on the project, throughout the project. One of those things is who is checking, so who has authorization to check? What is the method we're going to use to check information? And what are we checking within the information itself? So there will be some CAD checks and BIM checks, but there will also be technical checks that would only be carried out by chartered uh, designers, uh, those people that have the, uh, the capability and responsibility to check that information. So yes, how are we generating it is a standard uh, that has to be agreed. How we're going to check it is a standard that needs to be agreed. And what do we check is a series of standards that need to be agreed across the project team. Otherwise, you are at risk of people being unsure uh, about what you're delivering. If you all agree on that methodology, you will all understand the, uh, the standard to which the information is being delivered. It has been checked. It has been reviewed and a statement has been made to what use you can put it to. Um, guys, may I remind you that this is one of the points that you should be writing on in your brief, the standards for checking, just wanted to remind you. Uh, okay, another question. Um, which TIDP role is responsible for signing off the work in progress before it crosses onto the shared area? Okay, first of all, you can assign the responsibilities, as I've just said but also the authority. So who signs off each of the pieces of information as it transfers into the shared area? The first person could be the task information manager. We'll check against the SMP. Has it been checked against the standard methods and procedures? The task information manager will also check that it contains the data that's been asked uh, for delivery. And the task team manager, the design manager, could be the lead architect could be the lead designer or lead structural engineer it is the person who has the greatest authority on the project who signs off the technical content so the managing architect will sign off the technical content of the architectural information and the lead designer in a structural sense will sign off the technical content uh, of the structural work and so on through the other disciplines uh, does the archive have a set level of information that has to be included? 
Um, what is in the archive is everything that was transacted. So in itself, uh, there is no limitation. It is every single transaction, every single document that passes between the teams and is carrying project information, is replicated and it is audited. That is, it is made available and kept a copy in the archive or at least kept somewhere on the common data environment uh, with, a, with a tag on it, uh, a pointer that allows us to access it uh, at any time during the project. So quick reference there is the archive is self-populating. It is populated with everything that happens on the project. Another question. Uh, I believe training the team for design is different than the team for the contractor, uh, clash detection-wise. Is this right? There is no clash detection in this activity. Um, you can use a tool if you want to check things, but this is a clash avoidance process. There is no need to clash, uh, do clash detection in, in reality if you follow these processes. But the process is exactly the same in the delivery of the information in the check, review and issue for the professional design teams as well as the uh, contractor's design portion uh, working with his specialist designers. The processes and the methodologies are exactly the same. Okay. Um, what what uh, is the site available to carry out the CDE activities in the market? Can we see a sample of a few sites of CDE? Uh, can we come back to that uh, later on towards the end of the, uh, uh, the presentation? Okay, because there's another related one, how does project-wise work with revenue models? So it's related to it. Okay. Um, I, I can answer that question um, and we'll answer it at the end of the project, uh, at the end of this uh, module. That's all for now. Okay, we'll, we'll move on. So going through these four uh, areas of the, of the common data environment, as you'll see later on in the extended view, there are more than four areas actually. But these are the main functional areas. So work in progress is non-verified design data used by the in-house design teams until so it has a, has a suitability code on it, as you can see there, of S0. Suitability status code S0 means this information cannot be used for any purpose outside of this work in progress area. The version or revision and version is P, preliminary, is preliminary information. It hasn't been signed off as contractual at this point, and it has an indexing on there. So the index is 01, 02, 03, 04 for the revision, but there is also a sub-index, a version of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. We'll talk about those a little later on as to why they're there. So this can be individual people in the professional design task team. Let's say this is the architect. So this could represent, say, three different people working on this project. They produce their information. They put it through the approval process. They share it with one another but this is each individual team working individually in their own offices with shared information. The work in progress section of the CD is where members of the project team, as I've just said, carry out their own work using the company's IT systems. Such work in progress information is likely to be stored on your in-house servers with access to change information limited to the owners, that is the owners of the information, and other project team members that the company uh, specified can view it. So there are some access references required in the SMP. You will set up who is allowed to access what information, so a whole set of securities. And it's important to understand that within the Office of Individual Disciplines, it's essential to maintain the same process. And that is the same process of check, reviewing and signing off before you share it with one another. Uh, so this is the common data environment uh, work in progress area. Um, there's a question related to that. Um, so what checks should be used for issuing of the work in progress models, i.e. weekly issues, etc.? There is no set definition as to saying that you're going to issue a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or once a week or once a month is not what the common data environment is about. The common data environment is about releasing information as soon as significant information is available to stop other teams carrying out abortive work. So if you have a change, let's say you are the initiating agent, 
if you have a change that you know about, you must impart that to the other teams as soon as you possibly can to stop them carrying on work that is going to be thrown away. So the task team manager or the design lead of that particular task must collaborate, that is, must inform the other teams that there is a change coming and should release that information as quickly as possible. It does not have to be complete when you issue it. You can issue it uh, um, in, in a series of sequences, but whatever you issue should be complete and correct to that point. It doesn't have to be complete in its entirety, but whatever you publish should be correct. The checks that you do to uh, put it into the shared area are listed here as the check the model for stage completeness or indeed into stage completeness because you will continually issue information uh, during the delivery of each stage. The change model, uh, you move the suitability to a purpose, what you can use it for. So here, S1 says you may use this information for spatial coordination or coordination, and you would set the, uh, the uh, revision code to the first integer, so P1, P2, P3. What you also do if you have dissimilar, people are using dissimilar software, one way of checking that you have no clashes is to share a clash rendition, which will be in the viewing software of choice. This is not a clash detection activity carried out by somebody else. This is about each author of the information checking their information does not have any clashes before they issue it. You will also check that information at the exchange point uh, has been fully delivered in the COBE. So your federated model and the federated COBE should contain the information that you've been asked to deliver at the stage completeness. So I said you're issuing in the stage, but at stage completion, you must make sure these things occur. And change, implement, and, uh, change information, information and documentation suitability to suitable for information and set the major revision. So whatever's coming out of work in progress as S0, you can give different suitability codes to for different purposes. So the model could be used at S1 for spatial coordination, but the COBE information would be issued as S2 suitable for information. Um, so it's, it's not placing any other uh, use of that other than here is some information that you can look at. And approve all design deliverables to be shared for selected suitability. So once it's had its technical checks, then it's signed off by the task team manager, checked, reviewed and approved and passed into the shared area. These are just a few of the items, uh, some of the things that you would check for. We mentioned the SMP, which is about check, uh, checking the uh, graphical completeness of the model. Uh, there are also these other checks which we're showing here in addition to those basic SMP requirements. Can you take a question? Yep. Uh, presumably you would have one copy of a model live in the uh, work in progress and another checked model with the same name in the shared area. The EDMS systems that I've used, Autodesk Vault and Bentley ProjectWise, don't like to have duplicate model names. Would you suggest adding revision codes to the model names? Would references then need to be manually repathed? No. Um, you, you have come up against a problem with some of the software that's available out there as to whether it can follow this process or not. The file name does not change. What does change is the metadata attached to it in the form of a suitability code and a revision. In most EDMS systems, if you put the revision code on its own, let's say, or even the status code on the end of a file name and that revision code is indexing itself, it is treated by most EDMS systems as an individual file and therefore cannot track the process of delivery and the updating of each of those files. Um, okay. If, uh, if an architect's model is released uh, to the shared area as S1 and the engineer wants to use it in their work in progress, does its status go back to S0 once this goes into the engineer's work in progress? No, because the, the model at S, S1 does not, is not copied into the work in progress area. It is only referenced and therefore its status and its revision stays the same as it is obviously in the originating shared area. When you have finished your work, if you're the structural engineer and you are going to publish or share your model file, 
you do not include, you detach any other author's information. You never republish somebody else's information. And that's why these things are all locked and referenced. You cannot change them. You can only use them as background information and you never republish them. Thank you. Okay. So it is the role of the task team manager to check, review and approve the information. It is the role of the task team manager to check the technical content. It is the role of the task information manager, the TIM, to ensure that all models and drawings uh, uh, conform to the agreed project standards. And it is the role of the task information manager, the TIM, to ensure that all models, drawings and documents are checked, reviewed and signed off for a suitability purpose before sharing. Now, there is a little conundrum here. And that is that whilst the task information manager is subservient to the task team manager, he works for the task team manager, the task information manager also has a responsibility to the project information manager. And that is, he's the whistleblower that says, I am working in a team that is not checking their information. Uh, the task team manager is not signing it off. Perhaps he's not there to be able to sign it off and therefore possible erroneous information is now being shared. It is up to the project information manager to then sort that out and make sure that all the information is signed off and suitable uh, against the standards, methods and procedures and has been signed off by the authorizing agents. So the task information manager has quite an interesting and important role to make sure that everything conforms to the agreed standard methods and procedures even if it means telling his boss that he hasn't carried out the correct procedures. Okay, the shared area is actually um, two areas in one, because you want to share with the wider project team, but there are also conversations going on between the design teams and the client. And so there may be information, once again, this is about security access, who is allowed to see what information, there is some information that may not be available to the wider project team. Uh, it's only a conversation between the lead design and the client themselves. So this has just been represented in this diagram by this pink area sitting behind the project shared area. So we have a client shared area as well. This is, this is about securities. Who is allowed to see what information? So in the shared information, we must have verified design data shared with the project teams. It is ongoing design development. It is not complete at this stage. The suitability code is S1234, and the revision will only hold the integer P01020034. It does not have the version on it. I'll come back to the version in a moment. So the shared section of the CDE is where information can be made available to others in a safe environment. The early release of information assists in the rapid development of the design solution. Uh, to allow this to be uh, achieved, the concept of information suitability or status has been adopted. So this is information that we sign off and we are saying that you may use this for a given purpose. It is suitable for a given purpose. We are not issuing it in a contractual form. And that brings me to the point that PAS 1192 part two has an error in the in the editing and publication. Um, towards the back of the document, you will find um, a chart that shows the status codes, the S's, the D's, etc. And also there is a reference there that information is issued under the status code, issued for coordination. This is wrong and the term suitability, which is in BS 1192.207, will still be used and that document is in the process of being updated at the moment. So use suitability not issued when you have an S suitability or status code. The information status gives ownership of the data to the design team originator or whoever has produced it and restricts access by others. So for instance, the construction teams cannot see um, information that is still in development. They can only take it once it's been signed off and published for construction purposes or any other contractual purpose. So once again, if you see on site a drawing, let's say with a status code of S1 on it or S2, 
it should not be used for construction purposes. So just to show there is this client shared area uh, as well as the team shared area uh, where co other conversations can go on with the client. It may be discussing a possible change um, that one of the lead designers may have to respond to. It is not information that is going to be available or accessible by the wider team. So once again, reiterate this thing, there has to be a whole set of securities that enables certain people to access certain information. Uh, this is certainly not an open environment where everybody can access all information at any time. It is also an area where if you have reached the stage where uh, you have completed one of the stages, you have now finished um, design definition, uh, it's been signed off by the lead designer, you're now going to publish your information, then you would put that information into the client shared area for them to authorize or accept that the content of those drawings satisfies the client's requirements and he will be willing to pay for it, if indeed that's one of the things he does, and allows it to move on to the next stage. Let us say that has been signed off fit for construction, um, then it will move forward and be built. So the authorization comes from the client or the client's agent through this particular shared area. So development through the shared area, sign off an authorization, for publication through the client shared area. Uh, can I take a few, few questions? Please. Uh, if the data is not repeated, does this mean that the structural columns or load bearing walls are not shown in the architectural drawings? What about elements such as roof structure, slab edge, etc.? What I've said is that you use that information to produce uh, your information in context. Uh, in this process, when it comes to the point where you're going to deliver drawings, then those drawings can be combined by the diff, those model files or those files can be combined by each individual discipline to produce their form of drawing. What I mean by that is that the architect will want to emphasize certain architectural features on the drawing with perhaps a thicker line and suppress the architectural, the structural engineer's information where the structural engineer may want to use those same drawings or those same model files, uh, but emphasize the structural uh, content and suppress by in a lighter or smaller line style all of the architectural information and likewise with the MDEs and the Ps. So it's shared information that can be reconstructed into deliverable drawings using the shared or referenced files. Another question, if the disciplines directly reference models in the CDE, assuming they have the same name, those models could update automatically for all disciplines referencing them. This may happen at a time that's not convenient, i.e. during an issue. Would it not be better to have a shared area on a project extranet, say, and then local teams create a local copy of shared that they reference and update when convenient? No, you don't have to copy it. You must not copy it. You must not have duplicate copies within the CDE or even in the extended CDE. As you are doing this by reference, it's not an automatic update. You will be informed that information has been changed and that an updated version is available. And it will be up to you in your discipline to attach that referenced information at the time that you want to attach it. So these are not fully automated processes at all for just the reasons you specified that you may not want to update and you don't want things updating at inconvenient points during your design development. So the CDE must be subservient to your needs, not you subservient to an IT technology that is not aiding you. Another question, how do we manage the ownership of the authors? Okay. Um, Ownership uh, of uh, the authors is specified in the file naming convention. Uh, that's why you have the file naming convention. So you can say, what project does it belong to? Who owns the responsibility? And we'll, we will come in a moment, just to stay with me for the moment. You then have the company or, or the, or the uh, practice that has the responsibility for generating information. And if it's a multidisciplinary in, environment, then you use the discipline codes of architect, engineer, M, the E, and the P to, to show what discipline is producing the information. 
The term author is very difficult because you do not put the author's name on anything. The author is an individual that produces information and it is only the company and the discipline that has ownership, not the individual. What we don't want to end up is that this is Pete's file or George's file or something like that. That is not a managed activity. So the file naming convention gives ownership to the company who holds the contract for delivery of that information and to the discipline within that company that has the responsibility for generating that information. The individual is not referenced at all. A related question, would it not be good practice to verify on the drawings who is responsible for what information if you are referencing in other disciplines information? Right at the start of this uh, project, when we'll deal with this in, in next week's module, is looking at the ownership of information. So all of these models, drawings or whatever, are assigned ownership when you are producing your task information uh, delivery um, plan. So we need to know what is being produced, who is being, who's producing as an individual, in what company, and how long are we expecting it to take to deliver that. So all of that, the ownership of all of that is sorted out right at the beginning, and that is published into the shared area so that any discipline can see any other discipline's delivery schedule and therefore know what is available to them. So they will be able to select the reference files that they require for the development of their particular information at that time of the uh, of, uh, composition. Another question, are there any differences to the process approach depending on whether the model is a single model file or a federated set of models? No, the process, I'm going to be very careful here, a single model is something I assume on a project less than perhaps 100, uh, less than 10 million pounds. That is about the size of project that can carry a single model. However, even then, looking at how you're going to develop it and how many people you may need to work on it, you may have to break it down. I do not see the idea of a single model being something that we should strive towards at the moment. I know, uh, and there are obviously limitations on the size of model that can be built, and that has to be specified, by the way, in the SMP at the beginning of every project. We do not expect to see model files bigger than so-and-so. Uh, this is to suit the technologies that are available uh, between the project teams. Some people only have very small pipes going into their organizations. They can only download so, so much information at a certain speed. Uh, so we have to cater for the weakest link. In, in that particular sense. But the process of, of delivery between the disciplines is exactly the same for a single model in that event as you do with a federated model. A federated model should be seen as a single model once you have referenced in all of the other disciplines information and it will have a federated COBE file. The COBE file will only have the information that's in that federated model itself. And all of those Kobe files will have to be aggregated up at some time into a single Kobe delivery. And I hope that answers the question. The same process, whether it's single or multiple. Thank you. Okay, so the shared area actually consists of two areas, as I've said, uh, one for the project team to collaborate in and the other to allow a conversation to be carried out uh, with the client or to authorize things. And it would also include, as, uh, as I've just mentioned, the client sign up process or authorization. So the work in progress uh, to shared process, as we can see here, you ask the question of uh, do these come back in when you reference them in, do they uh, become S0 again? Well, here we have the architect issuing different model files, grids, walls, whatever. S0, P101, once it's gone through the check review and sign off process in the shared area, it has a usability, suitability status of S1. You can use this for coordination and the revision rather than the version you now have this revision code which only holds the first integer but p is at the beginning of it this is the preliminary information it is not contractual so when information is shared it must have a status suitability code of what it may be used for this is about the third or fourth time um, i've gone through this so that i feel that uh, this is what we have to do 
uh, and a revision code uh, that is the sequence that, that demonstrates the sequence of, of development. It must be reviewed, checked and signed off by the relevant authorities. We'll keep saying this, a common data environment is about sharing, reviewed, checked and signed off information suitable for a stated purpose with the ownership of that information being known. Whilst this looks like a very uh, linear process, and in fact, any process, any design process is linear, somebody has to start off with an idea that they then share with others to, to uh, start the conversation of, this is what I would like to build, Mr. Structural Engineer, would it, will it stand up? Where do I need to put my supports? And at some later date, the MBEs and the P's come in, this conversation continues. So it is, a linear process. However, once it gets moving, this conversation is continuous. So we're not issuing information once a month. We're issuing as soon as we have a relevant change to the information that everybody else needs to act upon. So this diagram is just trying to illustrate that each of the disciplines, whether it be architecture, structure, or whatever, is continuously sharing information, which is continuously being, so we're sharing information continuously through these light blue arrows and we are continually referencing back into our shared areas to carry on with the work here is new information i've got to update mine i've got to see whether it works is there a clash do i need to uh, go and talk to somebody about this um, there is new design information that i haven't acted upon i now need to act upon it so this becomes a total process continuous process and at the same time, you are also in this process while you're developing information, other information may have reached the point where you need to publish it. So you also have this ability to generate information from shared information only in the form of contractual deliveries at the end of each of the stages. So sharing information is a continuous activity allowing for a managed concurrent development process, not restricted to a Friday afternoon. Files models are referenced, not copied. So there are not multiple copies of the same model within the system. There is only one copy and everything is referenced one to the other. And information may not be complete, but it allows for a discussion or collaboration to occur uh, amongst the project teams to go through those iterations until the information is complete and satisfies the delivery uh, of that stage. And at the same time, it ensures spatial coordination as a form of clash avoidance. I know I've said this three or four times already, and I may say it again as we move forward, but it is to understand that this is a managed process, continuously sharing information, get that conversation going, and end up with spatially coordinated information with, with zero clashes, a zero defect model. Uh, you take a couple of Please? Yeah. Um, uh, a question about roles here. What is the difference between the information manager and a BIM manager? I don't know what a BIM manager is. It's my only answer to that question. Um, it is a title that somebody's been given, and I do not know of any single specification that actually says what a BIM manager role is. However, there is a specification for a project information manager or a task information manager uh, laid down in the PAS and the BS11, well, particularly in the PAS and the roles and responsibilities, which we will be dealing with next week. CAD managers, BIM managers, these are titles that have been given to people to, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm going to sound really, really nasty here, usually to be able to give them uh, some extra pay uh, because they, they they require it because of their capability and competence. But the, it, uh, a BIM manager is not a title that I accept. Task information manager, I can accept because I know what they do. BIM is not a discipline. So you are either an architectural technician, a structural technician, or an architect qualified, or a structural engineer, Sorry, I, I, I don't see the specification for a BIM manager. Certainly in, in the early days when I was trained as a draftsman, I, I didn't have a title of pencil engineer. And, and that's where we seem to be with this whole concept of, of BIM. If you have a look in the PAS, 
uh, and certainly at the next iteration of the PAS, the only title of BIM is given to BIM authors. Uh, and it was put in there to suggest that information that is going to be in this BIM environment, there are many authors of information that make up BIM. In the next iteration of the PAS, we're removing the B from that, and it's just going to be information managers. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about that, uh, giving that sort of definition, but um, there, there is a problem here where titles have proliferated. I even know of BIM directors. Um, I don't know what that is either. Uh, and anything that's related for perhaps PR purposes, you just put BIM in front of it and that, that sells. Uh, that's not what this is about. This is about development of information and the management of information. Uh, towards the delivery of a project. So that's a problem since it's not specified in a certain uh, no. uh, standard. Every company puts different roles to that title. Indeed. Yeah. That's our problem. Yeah. Uh, okay, another question. Uh, how often do you update the version? I.e. if I open a model and change an element, do I need to update the version? Secondly, on a work shared model, each time you use synchronize, <laughs> does the version need to be updated or is that done at the end of the day? No, if, if you are filing back to central, then you have to keep, if, if that is what you're actually suggesting you're doing, using a specific piece of software, um, that piece of software, I think, if you're talking about software, actually keeps an audit trail, usually by date stamping of what changed from one revision to another. However, it is not possible to manage the files, to check the information, uh, review it and sign it off before it's used by others. There is a tendency in that environment for people to continuously generate information that's used by others that has not been qualified in any way that it's actually correct. So one must be careful that those technologies uh, actually aid you in the development of good quality information and not stop you producing good quality information. So on changing an element, one needs to update the version. Yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, what is the so while, while, while we're actually there, we've, we've come to this version word. Why is there a version on the work in progress? Uh, and let's get this right. When we publish or we share information, it has a revision on it. This is a whole number. So in work in progress, if we have a P01, we can make different versions of that 01 as versions. So I'm going to optioneer, I'm going to try a number of different design solutions, which I'm going to give a designation of 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And at some time after my deliberations, I select one of those options or one of those versions to be the correct one, and that is the one that I publish. But I publish it with the next iteration of revision. Within work in progress, I still keep a record of what uh, scenarios I went through before I checked it, and so the version number stays. Another way of using the version number is you may not change the physical model, but you may take an extract from the model. Let's say you want to calculate all of the floor areas. And if they're not correct, you want to make a slight revision to the model and then extract another set of floor areas to, to uh, until you reach a point where your design says, OK, it's now given me the correct lettable area. Let's say and that might, might be version 5.6, then I would choose 5.6 and then I would publish that as revision 5 or 05. So the version can be used in a number of ways, but it is important to track the resulting attached or extracted information to the model that it was extracted from. So this is another use of the revisions and versions. Uh, question, do the old models continue to stay in the shared area after they've been updated? That's purely down to the type of technology you use. Um, these are documents that Okay. You have to understand the way in which EDMS systems work. They're, sometimes they're not folders where you are putting these shared models. They are just in the system somewhere with a tag and a reference and a, and a, um, a reference to them. 
So the answer is they are all always available to roll back on. The archive, once again, is only um, a state index. So it's a tag that says mm -hmm. this was shared area at revision 26. And I can go back to revision 26 uh, and find out what was there at that time. So the answer is everything remains within the common data area somewhere, but they are not there are not copies in the shared area and copies in the archive. There are only references from one to the other. There is only one document, one file, etc. Uh, question about roles again. What is the difference in responsibility between a project manager and information manager? <laughs> Sorry, is that a project information manager? So once again, we need to understand what we're talking about with these titles. In in BS 1192, we don't have project managers. We have task team managers. We have project information managers, and we have task information managers. The project information manager is appointed by the client, according to PAS 1192 and the BIM protocol, to ensure that all of the information that was requested in his employer's information requirement is delivered at the right time. So the PIM, the project information manager, works with the task information managers, that is with the representatives from each of the design teams or extended design teams, and agrees on what information needs to be delivered, uh, delivered, how it's going to be delivered, and what the standard is for that delivery. So the PIM holds control over the project SMP, and the TIMs, the task information managers, ensure that those standards are being carried out within each of the project teams. So there are the responsibilities. So project information manager is exactly what it says. He is the one that is ensuring that the information that's being requested from the project is delivered. But he's not a project manager in perhaps the looser term of I'm a design manager, architectural design manager, or a structural design manager. I may just add one thing here, uh, the project manager can also be responsible for other things such as financial issues, such as uh, issues on site, uh, mobility, uh, uh, cost, a, lo a lot of things that time management, a lot of things which might not be part of the project information manager's role, although the project manager can also uh, take up the project information manager role. It really d depends on how you define it right from the start. Indeed. Start from, yeah, from the in employee's information requirements and later on, of course, in the BEP where everything has to be defined, roles and responsibilities. Yeah. If we go back to PAS 1192, we have tried to do this uh, in, in, in the term that the project manager, which is the old term that we may be using, or project design coordinator or design coordination manager that used to be employed by the contractor, actually has a title now which is project delivery manager. So the project delivery manager is the person that can coordinates all of the design teams professionally and specialists to deliver their information in a timely fashion against the project and plan for the construction delivery. The project information manager has a similar responsibility for the delivery of information. And the TIM, as I say, is subservient to the PIM in making sure that that information is delivered by each of the task teams. We changed the names because the industry seemed to be getting confused between a project manager as somebody who works in an office, a project manager or a project design coordinator that works usually for the contractor or indeed the client who manages the timely delivery. We've changed these titles to project delivery manager so that we could give a specification for that role. And we, we didn't end up with five or six different versions of it. Okay, another question. At what point is the model expected to be clash free? And does it really matter if there are clashes between two small pipes when there is clearly space for them to fit? Yes, what you draw is what you build. So if you've drawn something to clash, that's the way it will be built. Because don't forget, this information is going to be used to manufacture those pipes. And therefore, they may be delivered to site, pre-manufactured, so that they do clash. So the whole point about this is that the virtual construction model must represent what you're going to build. There will inevitably be defects and deviations. <coughs> so you will get some clashes on site, even though the model may be clash-free. <coughs> 
and therefore the model must be updated to represent exactly what was built. <coughs> if you go back to the first sentence was, at what point are they clash free? They are clash free at the point of design. <coughs> so you're not waiting for somebody else to check to see whether you've clashed with something and then try to manage it out later on. It is part of the continual process. Anything you issue should be clash free. <coughs> I'll just modify that slightly by saying I would accept that there may be some clashes in the models, but they are only unresolved design solutions. So it may end up in the shared area with a clash still in it, waiting for a designer to make a decision to unclash it, because there may be other information that's required <coughs> to change the design. So any clash that's left in there is an unresolved design decision, which must be resol resolved before it ever gets to construction information. You will excuse me, I just... <laughs> Uh, guys, by the way, about the roles and responsibilities, we're going to have another uh, webinar later on talking about roles and responsibilities and titles. So don't worry, we will discuss that again. Uh, another question, Ruben. Uh, Please. So you save individual files of each version? In the work in progress area, certainly. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, there is a... Um, a um, a clarification needed here. So the CDE management uh, is equal to the PIM. Is this right? I'm not sure what that means exactly. So the CDE management is? Is equal to the project information management, I'm guessing the same. Okay, the common data environment, depending in which form you put it together, and we, we will talk about this a little bit more later, what you're looking for is an automated process as far as you can. So as you, as you file away your model files, then it's a good thing if that automatically updates the revision and the version. The only time when you have a manual transfer is when you publish into the shared, or you transfer into the shared area, where you remove the version index. So that in the shared area, you only have revisions. But you can actually set the systems up to do that. You mentioned project-wise early, earlier, that is one of the uh, systems that does do that, as, as do a number of others. Not all of them, but a number of others do the same thing. So you can automate this process to a large degree. I think what the question might mean, Mervyn, is um, are the responsibilities of the project information manager used <coughs> to manage the common data environment? That is the role that is placed upon him um, by, the, by the author, by the uh, employer. So that is the first thing, and that is the responsibility of the PIM is to provide a common data environment. It does not state that he manages it necessarily, but he is there to make sure one is available and has been provided for the project. So you really need to read the BIM protocol carefully as to what the responsibility of the PIM is. He will say, I want one of these and it will be made available for the full project team. It will most likely as a tool be managed by the project IT managers not by the BIM authors. So would there be a, a separate information manager with the presence of a project information manager? That is the project information manager, as it says in the protocol, that's appointed by the, well, it, when it doesn't say appointed, actually, what it says is ensures that there is a project information manager on the project. So it may be the design lead that will make that uh, him available at during the design process and there may be a baton handling activity that is they may then pass over the responsibility to a project information once it moves to the construction phase or the construction uh, production information stage or it may be that the PIM uh, like a project delivery manager will be appointed by the client and they remain there for the duration of the project there are different ways of, of that person being available Whatever it is, they have a responsibility for the CD, but they don't necessarily manage it in terms of being IT managers or IT specialists. There is talk here about soft clashes, but I think this is not the about uh, soft clashes. Yeah, okay. Um, yes, let's go there. What about clashes? 
what's the definition of soft clash? A uh, soft clash is well, two possibilities which people don't take into account when they're building their models. So a soft clash could be that there is some insulation, uh, let's say around pipes, and, and therefore we, we don't even want the insulation to clash. Yeah. So we must make sure there's enough space between the pipes. So you're not doing clash detection in that, in that situation. You can set up a lot of these uh, viewers to actually look at proximity checking. So can you run through this model and tell me that all of the pipes have a minimum of 300 mil clearance? That's one type of soft clash. That, that is the second one about proximity. And certainly that becomes important in, let's say, hospitals where you have inflammable gaseous uh, materials uh, being in close proximity, let's say, an oxygen supply line. You certainly don't want those in close proximity to one another. So you could do a clash against those types of things. Other soft clashes, which people do not seem to be aware of, is we are not just interested in the size, shape, uh, whatever, let's say, of a valve in, in, in a ceiling. We also need to know what space is required around that valve for it to be operated, maintained, removed and replaced. So most of these things, cabinets where you have to get inside to maintain electrical switch gear, usually tell you how much space they need around the cabinet for a maintenance engineer to be able to maintain that, that, that element. At the moment, I don't see too many people modeling that volume, that space. These are the soft clashes. If we have a look at some other architectural requirements or health and safety requirements or even disability requirements is we, how many people are actually checking to make sure that their door swings, let's say in a corridor, still allow wheelchair um, access. So the doors are not touching one another. And any two doors that are left open in the corridor leave a, leave a space of, I, I can't remember what the distance is, but let's say 1.2 meters so that a wheelchair could pass through. So there are lots of other checking capabilities that you could use some of these tools for that people are not using them for at the moment. Again, guys, we will talk a lot about class detection later on as well. Yeah. Uh, where does a design consultant fit into making things clash free? Again, the roles and responsibilities. Uh, yes. Uh, well, the part of the problem here is um, we have to go right the way back, which we will be doing next week, to the volume strategy. And that is, what is the role of the consultant versus the role of the specialist engineer, if we're going to use the term consultant about engineers, they can have consulting architects, of course. Uh, you have to look at what is the responsibility uh, of one or another. If we look at it in the MEP situation, usually we find that mechanical or ductwork consultants only carry out the symbolic design in terms of graphical representation of a ductwork system. So they will tell you where it goes. They will tell you what size duct you really need. They may tell you where a valve needs to be, but the actual duct, the actual valve, the actual bend is usually selected by the specialist designer who takes the consultant's output and produces a ductwork system that conforms to the design intent. It is then the responsibility of the consultant engineer to check the specialist's uh, final solution to make sure that it still complies mathematically because let's face it they, that is a fluid dynamics exercise uh, so you have to re re uh, check that the ductwork provided carries out the requirements of the consulting engineer it is understanding the responsibilities and, and what the outputs of these different people are um, question uh, if you are uh, updating the version or revision number on the model then you will have to relink it to the federated model the naming of the models should stay the same uh, from start to finish, but the folder they are saved in can be updated with the version and revision number. I'm going to go back to the first thing you said there. That the federated models aren't linked together in any way. There is no physical link between the federated models. What holds the federated models together is their position in space. So in the volume strategy and also in the subdivision of the project into federated models, 
there are defined boundaries. There is no overlap and there is no duplication between those models. It is the fact of where the origin of each one of those uh, federated models is that when you insert them into model space, they will all fit together absolutely like a jigsaw puzzle with no overlap and no duplication. That there is no physical linking uh, in the sense of a, uh, a reference link or anything like that. It is purely the way they sit in 3D space. So the architect's model, if the structural engineer's model for that same federated model, or actually they're not, they don't all fit in the same space. As you pull them all together and bring them into the single model for a viewer, they will automatically fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. Or for those that have used Soma blocks, uh, which I will come on to in the, in the next uh, module, um, if you know Soma blocks, it, it's a Chinese puzzle where there are lots of different shapes that you can put together in millions of different ways to make a cube. But you never end up obviously, otherwise the cube won't come together, with the different shapes filling the same space. And that's the same when you federate the model. Um, question, does the cost consultant get involved in this in the common data environment? When and how? Okay, yes, uh, if you're setting up a common data environment, right from the time of brief, when the briefing is being developed, um, so there is there is a, a thing here is about the individual projects when the common data environment is actually put together. We would say it starts the moment the client says, I want something done and I'm going to appoint somebody to do it. And if this, that is at stage one during the briefing activity, there is most likely a cost consultant involved at that, at that stage and they will be using information, that type of information that's available at stage one. We, we have been having this discussion today that what is the level of detail of information at stage one? There might not be any physical information other than here is a piece of land and I want to build something on it. Please tell me what's the best thing to build. It may be a simple question like that. Uh, and how much is it going to cost? So the cost consultant may be involved in answering that question, but there may be no physical model generated. It may just be information that's being managed to answer the client's question at that time. And yes, you could use a common data environment to do that. Are there any standard rules for clash detective reports? As I say, this is a process of clash avoidance, not clash detection. Uh, and therefore, um, if you are going to use a clash detector, it is about checking your model to see that it conforms to certain requirements, as I say, are things in the right proximity. For me, a clash detection tool is, 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 is better used for proximity checking, these soft clashes, making sure you've got good working space. From an H&S point of view, a health and safety point of view, you may want to just run um, a three-dimensional space through your building where people are going to walk to look for trip hazards and things like that. So we mustn't be um, we mustn't be restricted by thinking that we are building things. We are building information. And that information can be used to check lots of things, not just does the door fit in the wall. So checking walking spaces, health and safety, checking disability access, uh, working spaces, um, accessibilities. Uh, all of these things can be the, the clash detection software, or what I prefer to call them is viewing software could be used for. Clash detection to me, and I will tell you how this came about. Uh, we, when we were doing a major project in West London, what we needed to do was to find out whether people were following the processes properly, which would deliver zero uh, clash. We use one of these clash detectors. And if we found a clash, we would go to, we would find that person that had generated that information and ask them, why they had delivered information with a clash in it. Because what it tells us is, or well, what it told us at that time was that that person was not following the laid down processes uh, and procedures for developing information. So they would then be sent for retraining. Certainly not to Siberia, but uh, back to the training school for a couple of days, perhaps. Uh, 
the, the last question for now. The, uh, is the client not supposed to check and sign off the design uh, based on cost when it is shared? Uh, once it's completed the stage, yes. But the client doesn't need to be involved at each iteration or exchange of information during the delivery process. So yes, there will be a sign-off at cost at the end of the stages, at the end of brief, at the end of concept, and at the uh, end of the design stage, or certainly the design definition stage. Uh, that is part of the process of cost verification. Um, if, it, if it's going to cost too much, then the client's not going to move forward with the project. So yes, he is involved, but it is at the point when all of the designs are complete and satisfy the client's requirement, and the cost has been achieved. So the cost plan is continually updated, don't forget. Um, and don't forget also, once it moves into the construction model, the production information model, there will be a, a cost check carried out at that point uh, to make sure that the project's not going to run over the cost plan. So it is involved at each of those stages at the end of each of the uh, delivery requirements, stage one, two, three, four, five, whatever it happens to be. He added an, an extra part to that question. Would the cost consultant be also the the PIM as he is involved right from the beginning? Um, I can see where you're going with it. Uh, in the presentation I will give you on roles and responsibilities, our statement is that anybody could carry out a role because they are not statements of seniority or position. You can have more than one person carrying out a role. It may be a cost consultant, it may be a project delivery manager, it may be a PIM, uh, whatever we like to term it. So we're not, we're saying that any title could carry out any role. So if you wanted to use a project information manager to do it, if you wanted to put in there a cost consultant, then you could. You must accept that in the BEP, the BIM execution plan, what you have to do right at the beginning is state the capability and competence of individuals on the project and therefore it will not be the point of just putting a cost consultant in any given position it will be the person with the capability and competence to carry out that role thank you yeah. okay uh so try to get us back on track so we're, we're down we've we've whipped we've shared We've come up with a stage delivery. We've generated some information. Uh, we've verified it. Uh, we've qualified it. It's been authorized by the client and it is then published. And it could be published for any number uh, of requirements. You'll notice that there is still a client shared area there because it may be that the conversation now moves from the design team to the contractors team. So we still have in this published area or published documentation. Published documentation usually means that we now have a contractual document and that is shown in the suitability code here it has been approved uh, if that's the term we want to use and it now has a revision status on it of c it is a contractual document and it also will be iterated through the uh, through um if, if there are changes to it because it can change after it's been signed off as a contractual document so it could be c01 O2, O3, and O4. And once again, we'll be looking at those revisions uh, and uh, status codes, uh, suitability codes, um, as we move through these modules. And of course, the information that's been published, uh, particularly if we do, if we have a non serial client. Now, what do I mean by that? If we have a serial client, that's somebody that has a very large portfolio where we're building lots and lots of buildings and they have their own asset information model. When we deliver the information into the AIM, we will publish all of the drawings, models, etc., that were produced, um, were published, and also the COBE file that goes with them. However, that is the minimum information that will be delivered. We will also deliver for governance to the client the whole archive showing the full record of decisions, uh, the inputs and outputs of design uh, processes. Uh, so that they can have, they may not use it in asset information, but they may need to have governance over it so that it can be used in the decommissioning of a building. So we would expect to hand over the whole of the archive as a record uh, of how that project was delivered. So all of that moves into the, uh, uh, into the AIM area. 
So the published area of the CDE contains documentation that's been authorized by the client as deemed to be contractual. The published documentation of the CDE contains drawings and if agreed by the project teams, the model files and all other relative information. And they should be at that time produced in an in immutable format. That is that they are contractual documents and they should be published in such a way that they cannot ever be changed or modified by anybody other than the originating author. So a PDF format, if it's locked down and the right securities are put on it, is an immutable format, as indeed is a piece of paper. So it is a contractual document and as such, it cannot be altered or edited in any way. So, as you said, the archive will hold a project history maintained for knowledge, regulatory and legal requirements and a repository of the project information for non-asset portfolio employers. So this might be a developer that's just put a building up and all he wants to do is sell it on. Then the archive would be made available uh, on a disk um, issued to the developer. And if they want to throw it away, they can throw it away. But at least all of the information would have been delivered to them. The asset information delivery, whether it be in the archive, in the COBE or whatever, is now finding some prominence by asset <coughs> to estate agents, sorry, when selling projects that have asset databases. Um, there have been a number of cases recorded now that a greater premium can be asked for those buildings. So there is value in the asset, in the information delivery. The archive performs a number of roles, a continuous audit trail, the ability to check to see if anybody other than the originator has edited them, even those people that are concerned about people stealing their object libraries. That can also be controlled uh, within, the, within the CDE. It certainly is a requirement on a lot of middle, uh, mi sorry, medium cost to major cost projects <coughs> that the Health and Spacey, uh, Safety Inspectorate or <coughs> can have a full audit and a copy of all documentation to ascertain responsibility in the event of a collapse. <coughs> so these legal requirements, there may be other uses such as the, the uh, uh, payment in a dispute. I did this work, I delivered it at this time, I haven't been paid for it. And a repository for the as constructed information for non-asset owners, as I've already said, that can be delivered <coughs> on a disk. The, the person who's put up the building may not uh, be maintaining it. They might be just selling it on. So it would just be available if they want to move it across to the person buying uh, that particular development. Okay, the key points in all of this is files in the shared area are primarily revisions. There are no versions to them. So it just... <coughs> rolling this up. Files in the shared area are non-contractual. Files in the shared state or the shared area are visible to all task teams. It's not absolutely true because under the securities uh, that you may set on the project, only certain task teams may be allowed to see certain other task teams. So it's not, it's not open to everybody necessarily. Files in the shared state must have a status code to identify what the suitability of that file is and it is specified by the owner or the author or the a responsible agent for that information and others cannot use that information for any other purpose than the suitability that is stated files in the shared state can only be used for the suitability uh, that has been defined for them and if a in a distributed uh, cde is used there may be multiple logical areas that hold files in the shared state but there must be a single project shared area. So there are no copies of models. There are references of models from one um, distributed uh, CDE to another. Some of the, oops, we seem to have lost uh, the text at the top there. Sorry about that. Um, the status code are sh within shared. These are the non-contractual areas. So they are all denoted by the fact they have an S in front of them. So shared status and suitable for. So the S gives us uh, this, this confidence to know that it's, it's a status, it is shared and it's suitable for a purpose, S, 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 S. If you see an S 
in published, you know that document should not be there and you should not use it. So if it's published, uh, it must have an approved stamp on it and it must be uh, um, a contractual document. Other than the use of D codes, which I'm not going to go into today, I will pick that up uh, next week um, when we look at uh, ownerships. So the suitability codes suggested at the moment, you can add to these uh, for different types of projects, uh, may require lots more suitability codes or, or suitability of the information when sharing it. So suitable for coordination, suitable for information only. In other words, I'm, I'm giving this to you, would you like to comment on it? Uh, suitable for internal review and comment, similar to suitable for information, but in a much more disciplined uh, and controlled uh, re, uh, environment. Suitable for construction approval. Um, there has always been a tendency for people to think that once the design information has been signed off by the client, it's suitable for construction um, and it's not. Um, so we have to make sure that the suitability of the particular information is known. So is it suitable for, which isn't limited, which isn't written here, it's suitable for design intent completion or whether it is suitable for construction approval. In other words, it's come out of the specialist, uh, the professional designers being carried out by the specialist designers has been approved by the consultants responsible and is now fit for building. So the suitability codes um, should be established as part of the SMP uh, before you start. There are some guide or, or some of these things, as it says at the bottom there, we have given a description to some of them suitable for. Um, it says fit for in the BS 1192, it's suitable for. Uh, and it is suitable for not issued for, as it says in PAS 1192. PAS 1192 will read suitable for. BS 1192-207, the guide, BIP 2207, says suitable for. Uh, the reason why this came about was when the suitability codes were first devised, fit for was the term that we used. Uh, a couple of years later, there was a European legal battle uh, fought about shoes. Now, how do shoes affect the construction industry? Well, the way they, they affected us was the court case was all about what shoes are fit for. Somebody sued a manufacturer because the shoes that they bought leaked. They were not waterproof. So they sued the manufacturer on the basis that they were not fit for purpose, only to be told that shoes are only, the only thing about shoes are is that they're usually worn on the feet, but there is no description on a shoe box that says what those shoes are capable of <laughs> defending. If it says a pair of Wellingtons for use in wet weather to keep your feet dry, then that is a fit for statement. So we, we got caught up with this term fit for by the legal people. So we had to find another word. Um, it could either be suitable for or shared for, um, but we're not issuing it because issue to issue something suggests that it is a contractual situation. And whip to shed is non-contractual, as we said. So we don't want to use anything that could be seen to be a contractual jargon or jargonese. These are being updated at the moment as we move these documents to international standards. Uh, so this will all be sorted out over the, the coming months. But from me to you at the moment, it's suitable for in the BS, suitable for in the BIP, and suitable for in the PAS 1192 part two. So fit for will be updated to read suitable for. Some additional codes have been added in PAS 1192, such as S8 for clash rendition. So there should not be a change in PAS 1192, but there may be some additions and we have put some additions in there. Stage codes have been added for the volume strategy, which is the presentation I will give you, show you next week. And the use of the suitability codes and the revision versioning codes will be demonstrated in the CDE process. And it says in the next slide that uh, in a few minutes, as we go through the animated process. I can take a few questions. Yes, please do. Um, if you hand over models and data to the client, does the client need a web-based CDE to act as a home for their uh, AIM asset information? Um, okay, this will be defined in the EIR by the client. So the client will tell you 
in what format you will need to deliver the information. At the moment, the standard configuration is that you will issue native format files for the models and the drawings. You will issue renditions, uh, that is clash rendition, so viewer uh, formats, IFC format, if you like. You will issue a Kobe file, uh, so it's specifying that it will be in a Kobe format, Excel spreadsheet, whatever. Um, so this is not up to you in the way that you deliver it. This will be up to the client to tell you how they want it delivered. And then they will use whatever technology they have available, which will obviously be commensurate with what they've asked for, or they are intending to buy the technology to reuse that information. Uh, we're not going into PAS 1192 part three at the moment. Um, and we haven't actually written any standards or methodology around how you update, physically update um, the aim other than to say that certain events in, in uh, the maintenance activity or the continued use of the project um, will trigger off new contracts, which will go through the PAS 1192 process and deliver new information into the AIM. But I'm, that's all I'm going to say for the moment. Uh, that's a whole another subject. But just to we, we clarify. Later, yes? Sorry. We will discuss it later, uh, the, the part three. The yes, three. yes, we will. Um, so just to clarify that uh, for the moment, the client or the EIR should specify what formats information should be delivered to at the gate of the of the AIM PAS 1192.3. Another question: After issue for construction, does the contractor then create their own CDE? The contractor is already working in the CDE to have produced his for construction model with his specialist subcontractors. Uh, so the, the, the common data environment runs right throughout the life cycle, as I demonstrated in the first slide. If you remember, the common data environment goes throughout the total process with the blue management line going around the outside of it. So the CDE is a common data activity. However, the one used in the design construction activity may not be the same as the one used by the AIM, but it will have exactly the same functionality, yes. Uh, if no copying of file is allowed, that would exclude using any extra nets for the CDE? It may well do. Um, if that is the only means that you have available, then you must have very strict role, rules on how information is transmitted to others. And more importantly, if they use those model files to generate information which they're sending back to you, you will have to generate some very strict rules on how you test those models for acceptance back into your own common data environment. So this is about a disciplined activity to make sure that the information uh, stays pure, shall we say. So whatever process you're using, you must develop your SMPs to cater for that particular requirement. The best environment is when everybody is working within the same common data environment. That's, that's, Is that it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you, you're getting tired out there. I know the questions are, are slowing down. <laughs> so the uh, information management system, as we said, is this common data environment. Uh, so we need a file management system uh, to manage those, 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 those processes. And they are extended, by the way. And I'll show you some other diagrams in a moment. So at the core, you have a common data environment that manages all of the file management, which includes models, drawings, data, COBE files, documents, anything uh, that is to do with the information delivery or the information requirements of the project itself. That will be attached, we think is the best way of going to it, to some external databases. So everything within the model including documents and other stuff, should have a relational connection to objects, to documents, to, uh, to information files, etc., through unique IDs. Why do we recommend this? Well, part of the problem with BIM, as it's sold at the moment as a CAD-based system producing 3D models, is it doesn't allow other agencies, that is, other people and other disciplines and other uh, roles that are working on the project to input information or to 
develop it or to modify it. So I'm talking about procurers, planners, uh, people like this, even, even uh, it will get attached to the back office eventually in paying bills and stuff like that. So we need an environment where those people that have always been in, in the position of generating information other than a 3D model need access to the information to, to manipulate it. Uh, there, there's, there's, there is a tendency in the way that BIM is sold through 3D modeling that the BIM operator or the CAD operator, whatever he may be, um, is the only means of accessing information in that environment. That cannot be. And the reason is this. If you have a look at the total data generated in a project, less than 5% of that information will be graphically represented. Maintenance information, calculations. So we have calculation schedules. Um, how are we going to maintain this? How are we going to run it? Simulations. Uh, those simulations may be environmentally, uh, environmental simulations. They may be architectural uh, analysis requirements that are not necessarily carried out inside the 3D model, but in some other data form sitting outside it. So we do see in the center a file management system, but we also see a database uh, system attached to this where all other information is held. So the model itself is as light as possible and would really only contain information that modifies the graphical representation. So parameters and other things that only change the physical representation possibly of the items in the model or other information property sets uh, specifications, etc., would be outside the model. What we also need, wrapped around all of this, is the ability to manage the collaboration of the teams themselves. And that will include an email system or a transmittal system if it's the contractor. So there must be a total IT management capability in, in certainly on the medium to larger projects to manage all of this information for the total project requirements, sending instructions, receiving instructions, costings, ordering, whatever. So the CDE in the end of the day will be quite big and BIM will encompass all of our business activities. So in the build up to this, you've mentioned some products, so I'll mention it because it's been mentioned. Uh, you may have in the center there ProjectWise. Uh, uh, ProjectWise allows you to certainly link into an external database through EB. Uh, you can do similar sorts of things with, with uh, let's say, four projects linked to uh, an external database. Uh, and there are lots of other products that have been used in this way. But you also need this ability to, to link it in, if possible, with other email activities, so SharePoint, whatever. So this common data environment may not be a single IT solution, but a configured or, or the configuration of a number of different solutions to give you the whole capability. Contractors in particular, uh, where they're doing a lot of instruction, uh, contractual documentation, updating contract information with their specialists uh, and with their delivery agents, that is the fabricators, installers, constructors, um, certainly need good transmittal systems uh, and email systems to, to manage that process. So don't just think of this in the terms of one small office developing some design. This is about managing the whole project. However, at the, at the other end of the scale, in those offices and on those projects where that sort of capability is not necessarily needed, I have actually seen, and this is a demonstration from a friend of mine, um, and he has tried to demonstrate how you can do this using the drawing issue sheet. That is for anybody that actually remembers what a drawing issue sheet looks like. Um, I have been into a number of small practices recently where even the use of a drawing issue sheet is not used. Uh, they just issue things out through the email and really don't have any um, audit trail of what's been sent out to whom uh, at any given time. And that is obviously quite dangerous. So what does this look like? Well, if we look at the and this is a British standard, by the way, this uh, typical drawing issue sheet. It's actually broken down into a number of items which matches the common data environment and the TIDP, as it happens. 
So first of all, we have uh, a description. What is our model? It's a basement model, it's a ground floor model, it's a basement sh drawing, sheet one of two, two of two, etc. We have a reference number, which is the file naming convention or the drawing or the, or the model uh, naming convention as it happens. So NP00401B1 obviously is a level, it's a 3D model uh, and it's a uh, number ABC, one, two, three. If we also have the amendments in terms of this is shared information. So we have the P1s, P2s, P3s, P4s, P5s, etc. Or we have C, it's now a contractual document. So this is moving through time. So here we have the title of the drawing or the model, the file name, and then the different releases of information through the shared activity down to the publishing of information in the Cs and then the completion of the information updated as the as-built or construction record. At the bottom of each one of these amendments, there is actually a statement of purpose. So it's S1 for coordination, S2 for information, S3 for review, etc., etc., etc. So we have replicated on this drawing sheet all of the processes in the CDE, which hopefully gives you an idea that the common data environment is nothing new. It was the common data environment that actually replicated the issue sheet, not the other way around. So it was taking an old process that worked and moved it into a digital world. So suitability codes as a purpose of issue. We can see that S1 is a shared uh, uh, model. S2 is also shared. S3 is also shared. S4 is also shared. C is published. AB is published information. AB is published information into the archive. That is what's going to be delivered at the end of the day. So once again, the suitability codes and purposes match the common data environment and the movement and the tracking of information as an audit trial. So even on a piece of paper in a small office, you can still do this and manage your project uh, in, a, in a very disciplined way. Okay, so we come to the last, not quite the last bit, but uh, looking how does this common data environment, what does it look like when it's in progress? So what we have is the blue work in progress on the right hand side, this one here, you can see my arrow, the check and review box and the shared environment and then the review and authorization from the client into the published area, the archive uh, sitting here, the other black box is whose responsibility is it at any stage? And these boxes over here will uh, show us who the information author may be. So let's start off. We have preloaded the common data environment from the TIDPs with all of the models and documents that are going to be generated through the project. So the author of information, task team eight, sorry, something's happened here to the links. Oh, sorry, the colours, sorry, it uh, looks as if it's got itself confused. I'll carry on anyway. It reads at the bottom here, task team, task team A produces some information and they place on this, sorry, I'm, what I'm going to have to do is take this down for the moment and get you another version. Uh, so that I can demonstrate this properly. So if you would bear with me for a few moments, um, something's happened in the transfer of this uh, uh, this demonstration. So another one? Yes. I'll, uh, if you give me a few minutes, we'll transfer another version of this. Um, would you like to answer some? Just a couple of minutes, guys. We'll be back with you in a minute. I'm reading your comments, guys. I, I fell I fell back a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so 
easily done. And right clicks that one there we want. Control C. And We can. Uh, yes. It's in Mervin two again. Okay. Sorry, I'll close that one down. Mervin two, and it's the animation. Which one? Want to show more of that, but uh, no, it's okay. Leave it there for a moment. Um, now it's a separate. Oh, that's strange. Why didn't it come through? Maybe it's on the root. Did it fall in somewhere else? No, come on. Surely I didn't lose it. Well, it just says animated presentation. <laughs> Sorry about this, guys. Be with you. My apologies. No Technology. We'll have to find it um, in a moment and delete it from your computer. I'm oh. right. So okay, two. Yes, okay. Very quickly, Banty just happens to be another company of mine uh, that produces educational material. Um, okay, let's start again. So, once again, in the blue area, we have work in progress, the check, review, and approve, uh, the shared area, uh, review and authorize, uh, looking at the client, the published area, the archive, 
And over on the left-hand side here, you will see the different information manager uh, or information author roles as we go through the delivery. We've already pre-populated the, the common data environment with all of the uh, model files, drawings, et cetera, that's going to be produced for the project. That's part of the TIDP. And so task team A, whoever that may be, architect in this particular instance, the information author uh, opens up a model file and produces the work uh, or the model or the, the federated model that they're, they're going to produce. In this case, we've got four stories. There are actually one, two, three, four, five, six different models making up this, never mind that. And sorry, if we just backpedal that just one time. And over here, you will see that we have a revision 1.1. So this is the first revision at a version 0.1. And as I said before, if we have different scenarios, different designs of this, we can go to 0.1, 0.2, 0.3. Um, it's S0. It can't be used for anything. It's in work in progress. I've finished my work, and I now want to share it. So I place it in the check, review, and approve uh, process status. And you'll see the file is now locked. Nobody can alter that model file while the check review process is in operation. And the, we then carry out the different checks. So the task information manager will check that the model complies in all way, shape, and form to the agreed SMP. And the task team manager, the design lead, will review the information for technical content of the file. If those are all satisfied, then it is signed off to be shared. The first thing you do is change the revision to the integer, P01. You change the status to S1, and you tell people what they can use this for. It is for coordination purposes only. It's a locked file, and you place it in the shared area. Task team two, or perhaps some other discipline or somewhere, somebody else in your office, now opens up to do their work. So the information author opens up a work area, references the model files that they're going to need to generate their own work in context with, and they carry out their design and build their models, in this case, the structural engineering model. It has been checked uh, as they've been building it against the architectural content, and they know that there are no clashes in the model. So Clash has already been carried out as part of the development process. It is also at P1.1, and it is at, sta at S0 sta status. We're now going to publish it. And before we do that, we have to go through the check, review, and approve status. Once again, the task information manager will check it against the SMP. The task team manager or the responsible manager discipline will check it for technical content. And if everything's OK, will change the revision, or so you may change the revision to the integer. The status will change to what you can use it for. It's for coordination, and we push it into the, we make it available, we open it up for people to see. Those people on the security list that can have a look at this information, it is now viewable by them. Task team C uh, starts their work, pre predefined in the uh, from the TIDP in, in the CDE, the information um, author opens up the file that he's going to produce his information in, references in the information they require, which may be both the architectural and the structural, and carries out the design and development work for that particular discipline, in this case, uh, the, the uh, mechanical and electrical. Don't worry about the foundation at the bottom, just happens to be the model we were using to demonstrate this at the time and places it in the check, review, and approve process area. P101, S0 still. Tim checks it against the SMP. Task team manager checks for technical content. If everything's okay, the revision is cut back to the, to the integer, P01, and the status moves to S1 for coordination. We now have all of the information required for that particular task, this uh, vertical circulation model, um, all of the different components of the federated model have now been made available. So what do we do now? We know they're all check-free or clash-free, but we may want to make some changes. So the architect says, well, actually, I, I need to make a change to my original model. So the information author, architect, 
make some changes to the model in referencing sorry and should have referenced thank you uh, references in the files that they require to check uh, their changes against they don't want to change it and it's going to clash with something other than if it does clash with something then they have to go through a discussion a collaborative process to see whether this is acceptable let's say it has been completed nobody else needs to know we're going to put this up now for uh, check review and approve we go through the SMP checks with the Tim we go through the design check with the task team manager and we find there is something wrong it cannot pass the check review and approve so back to work in progress you'll notice now that we've increased uh, or we will increase sorry the re the version to point two because we had already put it into the check review and approve as, as one version one it was still revision two so it's indexed up from what is in the last shared so it's moved from 01 to 02 and we issued we put it into the check review and approve area as version one it didn't pass the test so it's had to go back for some rework so it goes to 2.2 changes are made to it it's then offered up again to the check review and approval processes checked by the tim against the smp checked by the task team manager for technical content everything is now okay the revision changes to two and the status goes back to s1 <coughs> and it replaces or updates that model file in shared area <coughs> however in the archive as you can see a record of that transaction is replicated in as an audit trail in the archive <coughs> so i hope the changes in these revisions and statuses is, is a little bit un, uh, better understood <coughs> it may be that we've now completed uh, all of the requirements for the different disciplines to complete the stage whatever that stage is <coughs> so the design lead will bring information author perhaps will bring together all of the files into a single reference file <coughs> and we'll sit down with the other design team managers or task team managers and agree that this information is now complete um, is clash free and a copy of that is then checked against the SMP agreed that the technical content the Kobe everything else is okay and places a bound copy of that into the shared area revision and status has been changed yep and if you noticed the revision is changing to status s3 for review so placed into the shared area sorry uh, for a final review by whoever else has to review it it may be the client's agent needs to review that with the task teams as well um, and certainly in this situation the client's agent has said yes okay um, I accept this everything is right it's complete you may now issue all of your model files documents Kobe files etc and publish them so what happens then is the task team managers of each of the disciplines will uh, change the statuses the revisions and the statuses on their model files so they now move to revision p0 uh, whatever it happens to be status x s6 is it's going to be shared in the client shared area for pim authorization so if they pass uh, the pim authorization stage we will then get authorization it's now been authorized as complete so the employers uh, agent or, or the the uh, clients representative will say I've reviewed them I've authorized them they were complete as you stated uh, in your review you can now change the revision once again check against the SMP as a final check make sure the technical contents okay you may now change the revision to a a contract document so C01 and the status now is authorized for stage three de deliverable a3 just means authorized at stage three if it's authorized at stage four it will be a4 etc etc and the information is then moved into the published area so we've gone work in progress signed off shared brought together combined model 
check and review that that's okay, put it into the shared area, share that with the employer's representative, review and authorize it, and once that's signed off, change the revision to a co contractual uh, uh, revision. The status moves to A3, because this is the end of stage three, so design complete, if you like, uh, and that is then published for other use to the, design, to the contractor to go out and employ his specialist subcontractors and then go through this process again. As you will note, in the archive, a full record of all of the preliminary sharing and all of the contractual publishing is recorded in the archive. So we have a full audit trail of all of the transactions and all of the decisions uh, that were carried out through this common data environment process. So that's how it works. Okay. So if we go back to the... It's at the bottom. It's open at the bottom. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Thank you. My eyes didn't go down that far. So if we now move on... Thank you. So if we have a look at this, um, what the CDE is doing is trying to remove some of these barriers for collaboration. I don't want to share my models. Somebody may change them. Well, the common data um, allows you to archive and audit uh, what happens to your model files once you share it. So you have control over it. So I don't want to share it. Someone may change it. Well, if they do, we can tell you that they've done it uh, and, and we can recover that situation. I don't want to use other people's model files. They're usually incorrect. Well, the check, the SMP, along with the check review and sign off process, and that is a process agreed by everybody, says that if you complete this check review and sign up using these standards methods and procedures then it will be as correct as it can be i am not negligent and therefore i don't want to use other people's model files is removed other people or companies will use my information for a purpose that i have no control over well you can state what that information is suitable for it's the owner that does that the person that generated the information states what the suitability is and as long as that suitability stays on the digital file, then it can only be used for that purpose. If somebody uses it for some other purpose, then we can track it and we can know uh, who, who's done that uh, and where. Other people steal my object libraries. Well, this is a big problem where people invest in object libraries. Um, obviously, if they use those to build their model files, if they share those objects, uh, objects within that uh, model file, then it is possible for people to download those object libraries. If you have data external to the object library, on the other hand, only the graphical representation will be shared and the information that would normally be attached to that will still be sitting in your own in-house database. You are not sharing the information that's attached to your object libraries other than the information that is requested by the by the Kobe file, which is a contractual condition. So other people cannot steal your object libraries, or if you think they have, through the audit trial and also through the uh, project uh, um, protocol, which also sets up a licensing activity as a contract that people cannot steal your object libraries. We can track and make sure that doesn't happen. This is, this is an interesting problem because if you issue a drawing to somebody in a paper form, as we did years ago, and they reused it for some purpose, uh, let's say it's a house design, and they went out and built, got somebody else to build it from your, your drawings, then you would normally be covered by your normal contractual conditions. And if you found out about that, then you would sue them. There is no difference in the analog methodology and the digital um, methodology. However, in the digital methodology with the common data environment, we can track and audit it. And so we can unblock these barriers. Oops. Yep, I'm trying to get. <laughs> okay, so understand what are our learning objectives for this afternoon's module. The understand the collaborative procedure within the common data environment. I hope we've achieved that. Understand the suitability code procedure, understand the revision and versioning understand the sign-off procedures for publication, and understand the importance of the archive. Other learning outcomes uh, really are also to understand how this tracks and audits your processes and gives you the confidence 
that you can work in a collaborative environment without losing control uh, over your information or that it will be misused by others. And that's what these processes, these procedures, status codes and revisions uh, help us to do. So I hope we've covered uh, most of the questions uh, about the common data environment. If you still have questions, then we can go through them now. Yep. Oh, you have some more. Good. Uh, one question was about the different software that can be used as a common data environment. Um, correct. Uh, as I say, I'm not um, selling or signing off or whatever, advertising other people's products. However, I can say that there are a number of major projects that have already set this up and are working with them quite well, where they have linked things like ProjectWise to Enterprise Bridge, running SharePoint and other solutions that have all been put together. These are for major projects. On smaller projects, uh, um, uh, we have uh, BIW, we have four projects, uh, we have uh, Business Collaborator, have all set up common data environments with varying uh, capabilities. Um, they're not all fully capable, I have to say. Uh, they have to be supplemented. So you may still be using SharePoint with Business Collaborator, for instance. Um, but there are tools out there that can be configured. Uh, be quite um, specific about this. They do not necessarily come out of the box pre-configured for a BS 1192 common data environment. The project will have to pay uh, for any of those solutions to be configured so that they can carry out this given process. But they are out there and they are being used. So um, are there any minimum requirements that should be in a software to be fit as a CD? Indeed. Yeah, we, we, I think you've seen, as we go through here, the sorts of things that you're going to need. Uh, Noha, um, earlier on, we had a discussion. One of the things that the systems should be able to do is to manage access control. You don't want everybody um, looking at all the information at all times. So any system that you set up, you need to restrict access to certain types of information financial discussions between the client and, and the lead design or the lead supplier. Um, that information should be in a secured area and access is only for those people that are given authorization. There is more and more becoming an important requirement that information cannot be taken out of the common data environment, let's say on a thumb drive, as I've just done, um, or, or, or on a CD or even through uh, the uh, um, social networks. So we're looking here at business security. So security is in every form. Those systems must be such that information can only be taken out through uh, a managed and disciplined process, possibly by a, a document manager, uh, as, as in the old days. So we certainly don't want people to have the ability to send this stuff in an email or uh, dump it down onto a CD or a thumb drive and take it out of the office. And that is for every type of project, whether it's in your office, you don't want people running away with your information. The client certainly doesn't want people running away with the information. And if we are in um, public works, then certainly our own security services wouldn't want uh, people running away with information about our hospitals, our airports, or, or our train stations. So one of the things you have to do around this, and you should be looking for, is the ability to control securities, access, and also who can view what at any given time, and maintain that audit trail of who did access information. So that is a prime requirement of a common data environment. Mm -hmm. uh, question, the problem is that the work is never sequential. So changes in models can be coming in even on issue days. What processes do you suggest putting in place to alleviate this, for, um, i.e. specified pencil down period? <laughs> Sorry, could you read that again? Yeah, uh, the problem is that the work is never sequential, so changes in the models coming in even on issue days, for example. What processes do you suggest putting in place to alleviate this? I'm not quite sure what you're stating there, because the common data environment allows you to develop information in any way. Um, as you say, well, if it's not sequential, what is it? Uh, surely sequential just means here's a bit of information, uh, it's not complete. I'll come back to that in a moment. I'll add some more information to it. In the meantime, I'm going to put a bit of information over here in another room or another part of the project. And then you issue or share that information. It is still a sequential and iterative process. And it is managed. 
um, each of those you use the term delivery date or something uh, those issue days um, as I said this is not an issue day you can issue uh, you can share this information at any time you could do it every hour if you wanted to if that is the way if information is being generated that fast you may have to share it quite frequently uh, in other situations it may be that there are long periods where um, people uh, don't have to share information uh, the, the models remain static to some degree we will see however next week in the um, the uh, volume strategy that it is actually possible to break the building down into volumes that are allocated to different disciplines in such a way that as long as your design is carried out and you stay within those volumes that have been uh, you've been made responsible for you don't actually have to talk to anybody you can carry out your work continuously and only bring that together uh, once you've completed uh, your, your, your portion of the work um, that, that may be difficult to understand at the moment that will become much clearer when we have a look at this next week the volume strategy is about uh, carrying out clash detection before you've actually started to develop the design um, once again that may sound strange but we will go into that next week so you have control it is sequential I don't care what you say um, in terms of there are add you can add information you can change information in any sequence you want so I hope I hope that satisfies uh, the question for the moment uh, why do we need to share combined models um, okay if you uh, can only see information in your uh, shared area you can only look at um, other, certainly people's information at certain times. What we're trying to do here is the lead designer at some time will say, I want to bring all of this information together into a single model, which I am now going to review with other uh, bodies. They are people that may not be able to access the shared area. So you bring these together, the lead designer, if you had the responsibility or the lead supplier, brings all the models together makes a copy of them, puts them up into the shared area and will then call a meeting and he will access that shared area. He is not going to review anything that's in work in progress. You only review stuff that's in the shared area. So you build this combined model, put it in the shared area and the lead designer will then use that in a review forum with the other design managers uh, to agree changes or to agree that they have actually completed all of that work. Once they've signed that off, then instructions are given back to the individual task teams to publish their um, signed off and agreed models now for uh, authorization by the client. So that's the reason for the shared, the model, combined model being put in the shared area. It's for review processes with others other than the task teams that may need to see this, may need to see that information. Uh, question the processes outlined all apply to models. What about sheets that may be made up of several models? Um, okay, the same process uh, applies um, As I said once you if you want to produce a drawing a sheet uh, I think you may be referring to something else and uh, You need to bring in or, or reference into your work in progress area the models you can only produce drawings cut drawings from models that have been signed off and shared. You're not going to cut them uh, from uh, work in progress. There, there are certain situations under which you can do that. But if this is a, a stage end delivery, then you are bringing referencing in the models and you will cut out of those models what you require to deliver your drawing. As I said at the beginning of this, the architect, the structural engineer, the MEP will all be using the same common shared information, but they will replicate it on their drawing sheets in different ways to uh, highlight their their actual design responsibilities in context with others' design responsibilities. I mean, so the process applies to anything, whether so. The process in the drawings, whatever. you will cut the drawings, you will check it against the SMP, you will check the technical content. So you go through that that gate, you will sign it off as fit for whatever suitable purpose that is. Uh, and put that into the shared area. And if that's a drawing going on to for a contractual publication, then you go through the, the same check uh, methodologies but that you put in the SMP, whether it's a, a model 
a drawing, um, a Kobe file, or any other form of documentation um, or data that needs to be checked and reviewed by the team before it's published. Mm. Same processes for all types of delivery. Um, question. Sorry, it's gone. <laughs> I lost it. Um, Somebody removed it. I just read them so fast. Uh, how can we extract information from the models and keep them separate? A lot of information is in the form of parameters. Are you suggesting these are exported and then re-imported when it comes to revising the model? Not quite sure what you think is understanding here because the model produced in work in progress never leaves the work in progress area. A copy of it is moved to shared. So you don't re-import a shared model and change it. It stays where it is. You're still working in your work in progress model um, until the next snapshot. So the shared model is a snapshot in time. So you're not exporting and re-importing. What's happening in the work in progress is a continual operation and snapshots of what you're doing are issued or, or shared at certain times. Uh, a single model may contain several sheets that have different revisions and statuses, stati, etc. Once again, you're talking about a particular piece of software which used in that configuration is almost impossible to manage through a common data environment. Um, I have just been on a project where uh, that is being used and unfortunately what we've had to do to manage the delivery properly is to use that particular piece of software as individual files with individual models that are not filed back to a central model. They are still handled as individual model files. So there, there will be restrictions um, if, on certain types of BIM software. I think that's the way I will put it for the moment. Yes. Thank you very much, Ruben. You okay. the questions. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, do you have any other questions? Again, the delay. <laughs> One minute. I think I'll write it. Okay, so. That was you, was it signing up? Uh, I was going to say, there's still a lot of people there. Nobody's left yet. Just a few. <laughs> okay, it seems that there are no questions. At the no further questions. So, yeah. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, Mervyn, and uh, see, you see you next, next week. Time. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> thank you, guys, and uh, see you next Friday. And for those of you whom we have a, a lecture with tomorrow, see you tomorrow. Okay, bye for now. What is it next Tuesday?